In the previous class, we started looking at some models of academic writing and we looked at statement of purpose and also research statement very briefly. Continuing our discussion, we will look at another important uh, aspect of academic life that is the research proposal. So, before we go to discuss research proposal, we will very briefly look at uh, teaching statement. So, this is uh, just like research statement is um, a necessary requirement uh, for many academic positions. So, what is it? Let us look at it. So, a teaching statement includes your philosophy of teaching and learning, a description of how you teach. Uh, so, it means your teaching methodology. General, you may you know um, follow slightly different techniques uh, to teach different subjects, but what um, the idea here is uh, some general principles. Then justification for your methodology. Uh, the statement can actually demonstrate that you have been very reflective and purposeful about your uh, teaching. So, when you go to teach something, you thought about it, you thought about the methodology. Then communicate your goals as an instructor and your corresponding actions in the classroom. So, uh, what do you uh, think as your goals as an instructor and uh, what do you do in order to achieve um, those goals? Uh, let us uh, look at a sample uh, teaching statement. So, you can see that here is a sample teaching statement. Let us uh, read it. My training at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania provided excellent opportunities for me to develop my teaching philosophy. I functioned as teaching assistant for several undergraduate courses at the Annenberg School including Communication and Persuasion instructed by Dr. Joseph Capella children and media instructed by Dr. Amy Jordan and communication and behavior instructed by Bruce Hardy. I also had the opportunity to teach communication and behavior at the Annenberg School. I am strongly committed to excellence in teaching as evidenced by my students qualitative and quantitative evaluations of my performance in the classroom and by their nomination of me for the James D. Woods teaching award an award which I was honored to receive. So, as you can see in the very first paragraph, the candidate here um, you know talks about uh, his or her experience as um, a teaching assistant for several undergraduate courses. So, then there is also reference to student um, evaluations and an award the candidate has received. Continuing, I have the good fortune to have had extraordinary teachers throughout my education. I try to take what is exceptional about each of my mentors and apply it in my own classroom. The characteristics that impacted me most are those that I work hardest to replicate in my own classroom. Enthusiasm for the material and strong critical thinking skills. I demonstrate and cultivate these characteristics by exhibiting a sincere interest in students individual development understanding their goals, unique situation and capabilities and by holding high academic standards. So, here uh, the candidate briefly talks about his or her teaching philosophy, uh, the qualities um, uh, which uh, the candidate attempts to um, in, you know, uh, focus on, enthusiasm for the material and strong critical thinking skills and uh, where have these come from? These have come from the candidates mentors. I try to cultivate an enthusiasm for the study of communication by illustrating my own enthusiasm for the material. I love what I do and I let that show in the classroom through the charismatic presentation of course material. In addition, I believe that an enthusiastic interest in the field starts with the sense that one has a contribution to make. I strongly encourage students to respectfully share their thoughts and questions in the classroom. So, you can see here um, some 
techniques used by the candidate in the classroom. There is a description to facilitate that exchange. I foster an environment where mutual respect is the norm. For my part, respect is communicated through my genuine interest in each student. I insist on knowing my students' names to show that I really do care what they have to say and that I see each of them as an individual with individual needs, goals and contributions to make both inside and outside of the classroom. So there is a statement here and this is not just a vague general statement, um, it is substantiated with the help of a concrete action that is you know trying to know uh, students' names individually. I also believe that students will be excited by what is most relevant to them. In order to know what is relevant, I must know something about my students. I encourage face-to-face -face meetings at least twice during the semester. I also arrive early to class so that students have the opportunity to converse with me about who they are, where they are from, what they see in their future, what their interests are. I try to incorporate what I know about my students into lecture and discussion primarily through examples. With reference to papers, I try to let the students sit in the driver's seat. I offer constructive criticism where necessary while allowing the students to pursue what interests them. This way, I can push my students beyond what they are capable of accomplishing alone while maintaining an investment in the subject matter. I also use the time before and after class to elicit feedback from students regarding what is and is not working for them in the classroom. I try to use that feedback to make adjustments accordingly. So here, uh, you know, in the previous paragraph, the writer says, I try to know individual needs and uh, goals. So that is elaborated upon. So the candidate says, you know, I come early, I talk to students about, uh, you know, even their, um, uh, you know, future, their interests. So something, you know, outside the course material. I also want my students to learn how to think critically. That is, I want them to be able to make informed decisions about the merits of arguments that are presented and generate thoughtful feedback regarding the strengths and weaknesses of arguments as well as the theories, methods and evidence that are employed to support them. Therefore, I provide students with questions to think about while consuming a piece of literature so that their reading can be motivated and directed. These questions include, what is the main claim in a particular study? What evidence is used to support that claim? Does the evidence that is offered indeed support the claim? Why or how? What other kinds of evidence could be used to support this claim? What are the implications of these findings? These guiding questions also provide students with an opportunity to have focused in-depth discussion. I understand that learning occurs when new information is integrated into existing knowledge structures and students vary in their baseline knowledge. Therefore, I offer a variety of learning tools for students such as a list of further readings that are not required but offer different perspectives. I also try to connect new ideas that are presented with content from previous lectures. So if you recall earlier, uh, the candidate mentions that two skills are very important, you know, enthusiasm for the material. So that is elaborated here, personal interest and uh, interaction with the individual students. Second is strong critical thinking skills. So these are elaborated here. So in this paragraph, so the candidate says, I give material to students and give them some thinking questions and some examples are also here included. I have high expectations in terms of academic standards. I help students meet those standards by encouraging and congratulating students when they understand the material and subsequently raising the level of discourse. In order to minimize the extent to which my high expectations work against my desire to cultivate an enthusiasm for the study of communication, I make my expectations clear from the first day of class. In addition, I am eager to provide extensive feedback on written assignments and I am available to meet for guidance. 
Although writing lengthy feedback on assignments is time consuming, I believe it is one of the most important pieces of feedback that we can provide students because it is tailored to the students own interests and abilities. Consequently, it is an excellent opportunity to explain concepts in a way that makes sense to the student. Finally, I account for progress that has been made. It is true that all students enter the classroom with different kinds of preparation and background knowledge. Assessment of the student's performance should take that into consideration. Students' progress should be recognized and I make an explicit attempt to do so. So here again candidate gave some more concrete examples about how she you know has high expectations in terms of academic standards and how goals are set in the very first class itself, how the candidate gives feedback. So um, overall um, as you might have observed in this sample the candidate clearly talks about philosophy of teaching and clear uh, you know, uh, examples of techniques and methods followed by the candidate in the classroom. So this kind of a teaching statement uh, creates a good impression about you. Now we move to the next important thing that is research proposal. So what is a research proposal? So this is you know uh, a proposal uh, a re uh, in the form of a request uh, for supporting your research um, or extension project something of that sort. So you usually write a research proposal as well to your university institute or some other funding agency um, uh, to su asking them to support your uh, research. So what are the things you include under a research proposal and what makes a research proposal an effective one? So uh, let us look at its components and its characteristics. Um, experts say that good proposals uh, you know, need to answer uh, the following questions. Um, what you want to do? how you want to do, how much it will cost and how much time it will take. So clear statements about you know, your research problem and your methodology. Then you are asking for funds, so details about budget and of course timeline. You cannot say that I will go on doing my research, you need to have a timeline and um, so you say that by one month I finish this, by two months I complete it, you present a detailed timeline. Then how the proposed project relates to the sponsor's interests. So uh, basically the question is why they should fund you. So say you are writing to an agency um, which funds projects um, uh, related to uh, information technology, then you should clearly specify how your project is something very important in the field of information technology and how it is related to the interest, the goals of the funding agency. Then what difference the project is going to make? So you have to very clearly argue that your project has long term implications. So recall if an, uh, uh, an external funding agency is investing their resources in the project, it is expected that your project will have long term benefits. Then why you rather someone else should be funded to do this project. So here you highlight your achievements as a researcher, you show that you are a credible person, um, you have necessary skills um, and therefore you will be able to complete the project successfully. Of course, these questions will be answered in different ways according to um, you know uh, 
the nature of the proposed project, the agency you are uh, writing to and so on. Many times these agencies have their own specified format. So, you have to follow the format uh, prescribed in such cases. For example, uh, Government of India Department of uh, Science and Technology DST uh, funds projects under various schemes and they have the format prescribed. So, you have to go to their website, download it and fill in details asked by them. Before you write your research proposal, some people say you need to first have something called idea sheet. So, this is like you can say uh, a rough draft. You ask yourself some questions and first you need to be clear about your research. So, this um, idea sheet will help you in preparing a good research proposal. So, some people say you can follow five steps to arrive at a clear conception of your research. So, let us look at them. Step 1, explain your topic so that others can understand what you want to study. So, first you be very clear about your topic and think of ways how you will explain it to others. Um, note here, you, your writing should be uh, comprehensible to others. They should be able to read and understand what you are trying to say. Then, detail the personal reasons why you are interested in the uh, topic. So, you ask yourself why you want to do it. So, only if you are convinced, only if you think you are a most suitable candidate, you know, then you can um, uh, go ahead about this. So, um, you think of strong reasons why you are interested in this topic. Step 3, identify what is at issue, what is open to dispute for you. So, what do you think needs to be researched? So, only when there is a gap, only when there is a dispute, um, then that is you know point for beginning of your research. If conclusions have been reached, then there is no point in you know um, doing a research there. So, you have research venues, uh, venues when there is a gap. Step 4, describe for whom this issue might be significant or important. So, um, uh, recall uh, we said that um, you have to talk about implications of your project. So, you need to think okay, who is going to benefit from this. So, if it is a say a project in uh, uh, development of a particular software. So, um, this software is it uh, aimed at a specific group of industries say banking sector or something or is it going to help general public say something like it is an operating system. So, you need to think about who is going to benefit from it. Then step 5, formulate an issue based question. So, here you clearly formulate your research question. So, how is this going to work? I want to investigate it. How this say teaching method is effective um, regarding schools um, located in rural areas. So, these kinds of specific questions you formulate. Typically, a research proposal has four sections. So, one is introduction, it is also called purpose, then review of relevant research, then methodology and then implications. Now, we will look at each of these sections in detail. Uh, as I mentioned, most agencies clearly specify the format and you need to um, follow, but the sections we men mentioned are most general and they also help us in other contexts say like you are writing a research paper, your uh, doctoral dissertation, um, 
So, we will look at these sections in detail. First one is introduction or purpose. So, what does this section do? Here, uh, the main idea here is this section describes the purpose of your study. Um, it says why your study is relevant and timely. So, here you very briefly summarize previous approaches to the topic and state how your study is placed in this context. Um, say, um, is it filling a gap or is it correcting a misconception? Is it uh, building upon and extending on a previous research or you are testing a particular hypothesis? So, note here. Uh, you are going to uh, look at previous studies in detail in the other section that is a review of research. But here you as I mentioned you do it very briefly you know how your proposed study is linked with the previous studies, how it builds on them. Then, then you state your research question. Um, here again very briefly details you will include under methodology and then you also say why you are interested in this, why it is important and what is at stake that is you know uh, implications of the study. These things again you will discuss later on in detail, but in this section you include them in a very brief fashion. So, in a way uh, you can say introduction is a kind of a, you know. Uh, abstract, it includes details um, uh, from uh, all other sections. You state what you are going to do, you very briefly link it with previous studies, you also briefly mention you know um, how you are going to do it and what the implications will be. The next section is review of research. So, as the name says, here you look at uh, some important previous studies, you review them, you sum up the um, findings, you paraphrase previous studies. The question is why do we need to do it? Note here this is also required when you are writing a research paper or a doctoral dissertation. So, um, you know you may be wondering ok, I am going to do something new. So, uh, why should I talk about previous studies? Actually, this is an important part. It serves many purposes. First thing, it clearly shows you that you have read you know important studies, at least important studies in your area of interest and you have a good grasp of it. So, unless you have read about it, you have you know knowledge, how are you going to do research in that? So, you need to demonstrate that you have a good grasp of um, you know uh, things going on in your area of interest. Second, you are going to place your study in relation to the previous studies. So, if you are simply going to do you know uh, something which has already been done, then what is the relevance of your study? You need to clearly show that um, after a, a review that there is some gap and your study is going to address that gap or um, you know uh, one particular uh, you know set of theory has been developed, a particular definition has been used in previous studies. You are not you know um, happy with that, you are offering something new. So, um, that is how you place your study in relation to previous uh, studies. And um, note here, this is actually expected of you um, that you know um, the important the uh, theories, important studies, current trends. So, these are important. Say, uh, in your research study, you say you are going to say develop an app for a railway timetable, but uh, you know, uh, something has already been 
developed and you are not aware of it, then your research does not become original and it does not contribute to the field. So, it is expected that you are aware of the latest trends, things happening in your area. Then, um, so as I said, um, you establish originality of your research, how you know your research is going to be a contribution to the field um, by reviewing and you know identifying a gap or if you are uh, replicating something which has already been done, you again need to specify what new things you are adding, what new dimensions are you bringing in, what new variables are you introducing. So, um, there again you need to you know um, clearly look at what has been done previously and now you look at uh, things in a different perspective. For example, if previous studies have looked at motivation levels of children from uh, you know families where both father and mother are educated, you have to now say that okay, see I am going to look at uh, motivation levels of children who are from families where parents are not educated. So, you are looking at uh, children uh, you know who are first generation learners. So, that is how your study is something new. Say a study has been done in English as a foreign language context, um, you are going to replicate the same thing in a context which is you know English uh, is studied as a second language. So, um, there is a distinction. So, these kinds of uh, things you highlight when you are uh, reviewing the research. Experts usually say you can you know use review of research to accomplish uh, the following things. One, you define or redefine a key term that is central to your study. So, uh, say for example, motivation. Uh, uh, Previous studies say in the last 5 years have adopted one particular perspective, uh, say they say this is motivation is interest to do something. So, you are offering something new, you are going to look at it in a uh, different uh, context, so uh, that you can do. Then discuss the history relevant to your research, so your area, so when it has started. Um, and then you discuss important studies um, over the last 5, 10 years say. Explain the strengths and limitations of different methodological approaches. So, um, different methods have been you know adopted by previous studies. So, you look at uh, them say qualitative methods, quantitative methods and so on. Say uh, in order to you uh, know um, uh, study uh, preferences of mobile phone users, say previous studies have largely used surveys. So, you say that okay, survey has its own advantages, it is but it has its own disadvantages. So, along with survey, I am also going to use personal interviews. I will go and talk to people personally to uh, get details uh, of their preferences. So, that is how you throw light on previous um, methods. Then, you analyze different theoretical approaches. Say, um, when you are you know uh, talking about how children learn language, uh, Chomsky's theories, you know, uh, universal grammar, these um, theories uh, have been very popular and many people have been studying um, how children learn language in that framework. So, now you review it and you say that okay, this has many issues, I am going to look at um, acquisition from a different perspective. So, you can uh, also um, uh, evaluate theoretical frameworks. Then, you identify trends in recent studies. So, say last 5 years, what has been the hot topic? What has you know uh, been uh, the topic of study? 
uh, in the previous studies. Um, you know, in this fast changing world, particularly in science and technology, so these trends keep um, changing. Say earlier, there were mobile phones with you know uh, keypads. Um, now that's gone. Now it's all you know touch screen uh, technology. So the trends keep changing. But if you still you know stick to something which is outdated, then your research is not relevant. So you should be aware of recent trends. Then point to a more comprehensive reviews of research that others have written. Uh, there are these papers called state of the art reviews. These uh, papers review prominent research say in the last 20, 30 years and write extensive um, uh, review. So, um, you may not be able to access all the articles, you yourself may not be able to uh, write such an extensive review mainly for time, space constraints. In such a case, you can simply refer to some research which has done such an extensive review. So, you say you review five studies um, in uh, you know how you teach propositions to students and then you say okay refer to so and so study for uh, you know more comprehensive review. So, that thing also you can do when you are uh, actually uh, reviewing uh, previous research. The next section is research methodology. So, what are the things you include here? Here you uh, include uh, the following things, hypotheses, uh, you know these are very specific things. Okay. Um, so, for example, if I teach by teaching students using this method, their scores on you know, uh, reading comprehension test will increase after two months. So, this is you know clearly stated in observable terms that is hypothesis. Sometimes you might just want to have a broad research question like uh, how is this teaching method going to influence reading comprehension levels of students. So, research question is something you know broad whereas hypothesis is very specific and is stated in observable terms. Then what are the tools you are going to use? So, are you going to use some specific equipment? You, are you going to use questionnaire? Are you going to design tests? Are you going to use standardized tools which are already available? So, uh, what exactly are you going to use for collecting data? Then process of data collection. So, how are you going to use the tools you have stated and collect data? So, you will also state uh, where you will be collecting your data from. So, like who your participants will be. Um, so, say are you going to go to a school, um, you are going to teach or are you just going to observe uh, students um, for one month, two months, are you going to send out a questionnaire um, uh, to whom. So, how are you going to send this questionnaire? Is it going to be in print form or an online form or are you going to do, use social media? So, how exactly um, you know you are going to collect data? So, the details are included. Next thing is data analysis tools. So, you do not have data with you at this stage, but still it is expected that you have thought about how you are going to analyze the data. So, it means you are also here clear about the nature of data. Say you are going to conduct a test, you will get quantitative scores. So, you would need some statistical tests, some software you know to run some tests. So, that will be one kind of analysis. If you are going to you know observe people, make notes, then that will be more of qualitative data. So, then how are you going to interpret it? So, there are frameworks to apply it. Say you are looking at a textbook, 
you are analyzing images used. Um, so, how are you going to um, you know analyze them? Are you going to follow a framework, um, a rating scale? Um, so, what exactly? So, those details you have to include and then justify your research methodology. So, why you have chosen a specific tool and why a specific you know um, uh, method of analysis. So, here you will link um, these things with previous research. So, previous studies have used this tool uh, to study this particular purpose. Therefore, you know I am also going to use similar tools or you say uh, the, the previous studies used this tool that was not effective because of these reasons. So, I am changing, I am modifying it and I am using these tools. So, uh, your justification is linked to your you know hypothesis, your research question and also what you have uh, gathered from an extensive review of previous studies. So, you use uh, you know previous studies to justify your research methodology. Next you know, uh, section is implications. So, here you include what you expect to find out at the end of your study and how these findings are important for stakeholders involved. So, it means, so um, of course, you cannot be you know very sure about findings, but you have some general expectations about outcomes. So, say you are uh, you know using a new teaching methodology, you expect that there will be improvement in students proficiency level. So, that is you know you are going to say as um, the expected outcome of your research. And then you also state, so how these findings are you know important. So, um, first to the funding agency, how is it going to be beneficial and then to you can also say to society as general. So, that is what we call you know stakeholders, all the people who are involved in it. Now, let us look at a sample research proposal. This research proposal you know is titled as you can see proposal for research the affordances of multimodal creative and academic writing. This is um, taken from uh, the book Green and Lidinsky 2016. So, let us look at the proposal in detail. Researchers Hughes 2009, Vasudevan, Schultz and Bateman 2010 have called attention to the unique ways that writing can foster student learning and have for some time now argued that teachers in elementary and high schools should give students more opportunities to write fiction and poetry using image, music and text to express themselves. So, this is the claim elementary and high school students you know should be given an opportunity by teachers to write fiction and poetry using multimodal things image, music and text to express themselves. So, this is not uh, the uh, person who is submitting this proposal that person's claim, uh, this is what you know some previous researchers have argued for. So, this is you know introduction to the field. Within the last decade, even more alternative modes of writing have gained prominence. Researchers Hughes 2009, Hull and Katz 2006 argue that multimodal digital storytelling 
provides students with ways to help them engage more deeply with their written work. So, this is building on what has been previously said using multi models you know, to um, express creativity. Digital storytelling in particular enables students to examine their experiences by writing personal narratives in which they confront key turning points in their lives and the challenges they face. So, from multimodal creative expression, writer is narrowing down further. Um, this is called digital storytelling. So, what do students do here? They examine their personal experiences by writing personal narratives in which they confront key turning points in their lives and challenges they face so about their personal lives and experiences. In turn, they can use images, music and voiceover to amplify and give meaning to their written stories. So, when they write, say they do not use um, words, letters, sentences, they also use images, music and voiceover. Allowing for what researchers call new literate spaces creates the opportunity for multiple modes of learning, understanding and collaboration that challenge the limited ways that students use writing as a mode of learning in school. Hughes 2009, Hull and Katz 2006. So, this is another important feature. So, you cite previous studies. We will look at citation and reference styles um, uh, later on. Students may learn to write persuasive essays, but they also need opportunities to learn about themselves and use their writing as a way to create changes in their lives. Thus, researchers urge educators to reform curricular and pedagogical practices to help students use writing to help them develop a sense of identity and ownership of their writing to see the decision making power they have as individuals. So, here. Uh, the proposer sums up uh, the main findings of previous studies. So, the benefits of using multimodal things. So, it will help develop a sense of identity, ownership, it will also you know uh, help them see their decision making power. When they argue that multimodal digital literacy practices have a place in the standard curriculum, researchers Hall 2011, Hughes 2009, Hull and Katz 2006, Ranke 2007, Vasudevan et al 2010. So, you can see extensive list of studies provide evidence to show how youth grow and develop, become more confident learners and use what they learn in and out of school. So, this is elaboration of this, the benefits of using it. This is particularly true when youth have opportunities to reflect on their lives and use multiple literacies to give meaning to their experience. They can use image, music and text to confront how things in their lives look and feel, to examine the decisions they have made and to consider the decisions they might make in confronting hardship, discrimination and loss. However, most research fails to provide a satisfactory or compelling rationale for why new literacy should be used in the classroom. So, this is all about what previous studies have found. Now, you can see the proposer is identifying a gap. So, according to the proposer, most of previous research studies, they fail to provide a satisfactory or compelling rationale for why new literacy should be used in the classroom. Then, the, you know, uh, some studies are cited here or how the seemingly unique gains could be positively integrated into the standard curriculum. So, this is another gap in the studies. The lack of assessment focusing on how academic and new literacies affect one another reveals a flaw in the conclusions drawn from studies that neglect the realities of teaching in K-12 schools. Increased emphasis on standards, testing and accountability seem to preclude the kind of focus that new literacy seem to require. Thus, if educators are to allow for new literate spaces, they need to know how to do so within the standard curriculum. So, writer here has identified a gap. So, how you integrate it into the standard curriculum that has been elaborated here. 
So, there is focus on you know uh, standards, testing and accountability. So, therefore, there is a problem. So, teachers, educators you know they need to know how to integrate uh, uh, new literacies into standard school curriculum. Specifically, few researchers explore students sense of their literate identity in academic and creative writing or how context matters in how students feel about themselves and their writing. While most researchers Binder and Costopolis 2011 you can also see there are more studies cited. So, refer to what they call the mono literacy landscape of schools the limits of literate experience to print none really compare the opportunities that academic writing gives students versus say creative writing before during and after the study. So, here the writer is bringing another point comparing um, academic writing versus creative writing that is focusing only on the value of digital storytelling for example, or creative writing is not sufficient to effect reform in school. Are there really significant differences between different kinds of writing? What are these differences? Such a gap in research seems to necessitate an inquiry into a student's emergent sense of authorship in different forms of composing even academic writing in and out of school. So, writer here adds another dimension. No. So far, it has been about creative writing, I am going to look at academic writing as well. Therefore, I propose a study that I will provide an analysis of both academic and creative writing in an after school program that helps children develop as learners through tutoring and enrichment. So, this is you know clearly uh, the research uh, propose. The, uh, the purpose of this study, the research question you can also say. So, an analysis of both academic and uh, you know creative writing in an after school program that helps children develop as learners through tutoring and enrichment. So, this is the uh, research question. One implication of my research would be to show why educators might expand the types of literate experiences that students have in school. So, the writer here is talking about the implications of the study, proposed study. In order to investigate the possible differences between multimodal creative and standardized academic writing, this proposed study aims to explore a the unique opportunities afforded by the multiple means of expression inherent in digital storytelling, b how and if these opportunities create an alternative space for the growth of empowered literate identities and a sense of agency, c the extent to which writing supports a student's development of an authorial voice and d why schools should be concerned with affordances given to the development of a student's written voice and individual identity by including multimodal digital storytelling in the curriculum. So, th the purpose of the research has been briefly stated here, we saw here. Um, now, the proposer gives more details. So, um, the proposed study aims to explore then there are four clear points. The study focuses on analyzing the student's sense of authorship in both their academic and creative assignments. To what extent can standard academic and creative multimodal expression help students develop an authorial identity and the skills they need to flourish in and out of school? Considering the current atmosphere of accountability and federal testing, Hull and Katz 2006, it is important to ask what role multimodal composing can play in the standard and narrow curriculum. So, this is you know about introduction. There is also a very brief review of um, uh, studies here and the writer has identified the gap, has stated uh, you know the purpose of the study, uh, then detailed research questions are uh, mentioned here. Now, the writer talks about methodology. To address the aims of my study, 
I will conduct interviews and focus groups to f examine students attitudes about writing in and out of school at the Crusoe Community Learning Center CCLC in a small midwestern city. Interviews and focus groups will enable me to discover student attitudes and feelings about writing across the in-school and out-of-school context in order to develop some insight into how writing can enable or disengage students. I will also take field notes taken by a participant observer in the after-school creative writing workshop to develop a picture of the after-school classroom dynamics. So, writer here says uh, uh, now the tools will be interviews and focus groups. Then there will also be after school uh, you know, uh, writing workshop and uh, a participant observer will take notes and those notes will be uh, examined by the researcher. So, this is, talks about the tools going to be used. Also, the location where the study is going to be conducted is mentioned. This is a Crusoe Community Learning Center in a small Midwestern city. Context. So, now more details about uh, CCLC. The CCLC is an off campus educational initiative of a nearby private university in partnership with the surrounding neighborhood residents. Serving around 600 participants in the regular programming, the CCLC also partners with the community schools in the surrounding area with program outreach connecting to nearly 8000 additional youths throughout the year. Located in a high traffic low income neighborhood, the CCLC's mission centers around promoting hospitality, education, partnership, civic engagement and sustainability in the surrounding area and all the participants. So, as you can see, the CCLC is a special arrangement. So, the proposal here gives more details about it. So, this is not a regular school classroom, this is some special arrangement made by uh, you know a uh, private university in partnership with uh, some surrounding neighborhood residents. So, there are more details about it. Organized around operating as a learning center and gathering space, the CCLC fosters relationships with the students, the surrounding residents and the cities, universities in a safe collaborative atmosphere. Classes and programming range from English as a new language ENL. So, this is another feature you can observe. So, you have used a term, then you introduce its abbreviation. Later on, you use only the abbreviation. So, that you may have already noticed here. So, this CCLC. So, the full form is written here for the first time. Along with that, the abbreviation is also introduced. So, now readers know when you say CCLC, it refers to this thing. English as a new language, ENL to financial literacy, entrepreneurship, basic computing and one-on-one -on -one tutoring for area children conducted by college volunteers. The creative writing class and the CCLC's curriculum curricular environment will provide an appropriate population and unique space to explore the possible affordances between creative and academic writing. So, here now the writer is justifying the choice. So, why CCLC? So, here is the justification. With the after school programming divided in weekly day by day activities entered sorry centered on enrichment, academic tutoring and creative writing, the CCLC's after school context is inherently connected to the student's school context. Thus, the CCLC's efforts to help students with their day to day school work and also offer enrichment unique to an after school program can enrich my understanding of the way students context in school and after school influence how they see themselves as writers. So, clear justification about the choice. So, uh, this is what you need to do. So, if you choose say 
urban population you have to say very specifically why rural then why then again cross sections you know say um, upper middle class middle class lower income groups so you have to give justification for the choice now the writer gives more details about participants participants at the cclc i will focus on ms smith's class ms smith is a former fourth grade teacher serving the center as a full time americorps member as an americorps member ms smith works in a federal program funded by the state of indiana for a full time 40 hour week at the cclc taking place every wednesday the creative writing class centers around brainstorming drafting and publishing the student work for display inside the center and on a developing web blog i have chosen this specific class and student population because it offered the opportunity to talk to students about the school and after school writing experiences alongside the physical creative artifacts they created in ms smith's class due to the participants weekly experience of academic tutoring and creative class time the choice was based on the wide range of writing activities that could be probed by the broad experience based focus of the question script so here are details about participants so the writer says is going to focus on a person ms smith's class then there are details about that person now data collection procedure and analysis i will conduct focus groups and interviews with the students in ms smith's class over the course of 3 weeks to obtain parental consent in order to conduct the focus groups and subsequent interviews i will email consent forms requesting each student's participation in my research i will do so 2 weeks prior to the study start in order to provide the necessary time for the forms to be sent home and signed by the parents for the complete list of questions see appendix a so you can see here the writer uh, includes the tools used in appendices upon receiving confirmation from ms smith that the consent forms had been completed i can then conduct focus groups and interviews with the participating students so this is about you know preparation and then i will audio record the focus groups and interviews following the end of each session i will transcribe the recordings though i will not take notes during the focus groups and interviews in order to maintain total engagement with the participants i will type a series of reflections and field notes after the completion of each audio recorded session following the completion of the transcriptions i will also take more notes to identify the themes that emerge in both interviews with individual children and in the focus groups so about uh, you know uh, transcription procedures and um, what will happen uh, during the sessions after analyzing student responses i will construct several categories to explore the cclc participant sense of self and authorial identity across contexts safe spaces expressing interest and meaningful message and ownership now implications though many and unique compelling findings support a pedagogical shift toward new literacies researchers uh, was there when at all 2010 tend to ignore the impact of a student's outside knowledge experience and context for writing moreover without clearly understanding the differences and similarities between academic writing and multimodal writing educators may not see the importance of including alternative modes of literacy in the standard curriculum so you can see the writer here goes back to previous studies so again highlights what has not been looked at uh, so thereby highlighting the um, contributions of the current study so i'll skip over the remaining part of this and uh, the next section uh, and the final section you see is working bibliography so include you all the studies you have um, referred to so here you can again see that there is a specific way of you know mentioning the works you have referred to so this we will see when we look at uh, referencing styles so uh, this is how you can plan your research proposal you start with uh, introduction you do review of research 
then your methodology and then implications of course, you can have I mean you will include um, bibliography uh, optional things would be you know appendices uh, like the tools you are going to include these things will uh, uh, you know uh, come under uh, appendices. To sum up, uh, so in this class we have looked at uh, one important aspect of academic life that is preparing research proposals. So, we saw that you do previous studies you know to identify gap uh, to decide what you are going to do and then you highlight uh, you know your study in relation to those. So, if you are writing to a funding agency you need to clearly say you know why they should fund you, how your study is going to be beneficial for them and um, what are the you know long term implications. You also need to include information about budget and a timeline if you are submitting for a funding agency, if you are you know uh, submitting it to your instructor as part of your course then you may not worry about the budget. Thank you.